Good morning, friends. You know, I, I, this was not planned, but we have some special guests here today. I met them for the first time face to face today, and I wonder if they could come up. I, they've got a great story, and I'd like to invite Lee and Mary Miller if they'd come up. Now, I'll tell you my side of the story as they're coming is periodically uh, amazing facts. We call people. They support the ministry. We give them a call. We say, thank you so much. So I called these dear folks who had uh, made a donation to help with amazing facts. We told them we appreciated it. And I think it was maybe even the second time I had called. And I don't remember exactly what I said. I was talking with Mary. And Mary was very kind. And, and she said, well, now, Pastor Doug, we're not Seventh-day Adventists. And you're from Mississippi? Yeah, and she said it. Mississippi accent, too. <laughs> and if I understand correctly, you said, no, we're Baptists. Right. Is that right? Right. And uh, I said, well, that's great. And you said, well, well tell me, why don't you tell me, how did you hear about the, the message that you were sharing? Well, where to start? Um, first of all, good morning, everybody. Uh, <laughs> well, we were Baptists. We're Seventh-day Adventists now. Um, just yeah. clear the air. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But um, we had started a journey, and I'm not sure exactly when it started. Mary might can tell you, but um, you're part of that journey, Pastor Doug, and Amazing Facts and all of you. Um, we had been Baptist my whole life, and she had been one for 40 years. And um, we just felt like we were missing something. And as we started listening to Amazing Facts and reading the material that you sent out and the Bible studies, it just became clear that there was more to it than what we had been teaching and learning in, throughout our lives. And so uh, just little by little, um, we became Seventh-day Adventists, and that's really not true. Actually, Mary was ready to become one immediately, <laughs> and I was the holdout. And uh, she did the right thing. She didn't pressure me. She didn't nag me. She just knew she trusted the Lord that the time would come. And so, um, as all men should do, I will turn the microphone over to her to tell you the rest <laughs> of the story. One of the things I love about Seventh-day Adventism is that it exudes appreciation for our Reformation past and makes it clear that most of our brethren are in other churches. Mm -hmm. and. We were very happy where we were and really were not looking to make a change, but God sent the information. It literally fell out of the sky into our laps because of a fellow Baptist who just saw a particular sermon and he sent us the link, and that was all it took. <laughs> One good sermon leads to another. <laughs> Now, if I understand correctly, when I was first talking to you, you said, um, well, we're studying this information, and one of you was teaching a Sunday school class? I was, yes. And you were using the material. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, did you like, edit a Sunday school paper or for the church or something? Um, well, no, I was in some leadership positions okay. at the church, and, and it was very easy to, to just take what I was learning <laughs> And, and apply it, whether in Sunday school classes or in meetings or leadership or whatever. And it was, it was just, you know, so clear and so true. Amen. Now, then there was a while there, I think I talked to you, Mary, and you said, well, we're also going to the Adventist church on Saturday. Yes. Um, he continued to teach on Sundays, and we attended our local Adventist church, which is a wonderful church. And he was sharing what we were learning in the Sunday class, and they loved it. <laughs> they loved it. And um, how'd the pastor feel? Oh, <laughs> that's that's a different story. We'll we'll not get into that just right away. Long and the short of it is, I've kind of realized there's there's two types of believers out there. One type looks for and welcomes correction. Mm -hmm. And I, for one, am very thankful to have been corrected on many points. And then the other type 
does not want the correction. And so my prayer is just that for all of our brothers and sisters scattered throughout the world, that they will want to be corrected if there's a correction to be made. Be open to the truth. Right. Amen. Yes. yes. And then I, I forget how long ago it was, uh, but then I got a, a picture from Mary, sent me a picture of them being baptized, and she said, we no longer have our feet in two boats anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. I don't know. Maybe I, yeah. those are my words, but it, it was just such a joy. And then when I heard they were coming out today, this is my first chance to meet them face to face. It's uh, just such a pleasure. And uh, it's good to know the Word of God is making a difference. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Thank you. God bless Amen. you. We sure appreciate it. Well, thank you. We'll visit with you more a little <laughs> okay, later. Sure. Thank you so much. <laughs> Amen. I thought it'd be good for us together to uh, just see, you know, the, the broadcasts do make a difference. God has his sheep in other folds, Jesus said, and them also I must call, and there will be one fold and one shepherd. As we near the end, there's going to be a big shaking, and true Christians everywhere, they're going to be polarized into one of two groups, and we want to be founded on the word. Amen? Amen. I appreciate what Mary said, that we need to be open to God correcting us and leading us into new truth. And uh, if we're humble, God can do that. We're teachable. Amen? So our message today is titled, Repairing the Roads of Refuge. And uh, we're going to be talking about roads. Life is a road. You are on the road. Whether you want to be or not, Jesus said you're either on the the broad way to destruction of the narrow road to life, but you're on the road. And the Christian life is a walk. And it's interesting when Jesus called Peter and James and John and Andrew and Matthew, it says, as he walked by, he called them. They dropped what they were doing and they began to walk with him. And so uh, I, I'm interested in roads. Now I'm going to start by telling you a little amazing fact. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Transcontinental Motor Convoy. After World War I, there was a lot of problems with the, um, the roads in Europe. They noticed that as a result of the trench warfare, that the, the vehicles had a really hard time getting around. And so the US military got a bright idea. They said, you know, if there's another war, maybe a war in the Pacific, we're having problems moving are people here in North America. This is shortly after the invention of the car. There were not that many roads in North America. We had trains that went coast to coast, but not a lot of roads. So they got the idea. They said, well, let's have a convoy that will go from Washington, D.C. to San Francisco. We'll explore the, explore the conditions of the road, do a little survey along the way, and we'll also see how well our troops move on these primitive roads. So they got together 80, 81 motorized vehicles, no horses, 280 soldiers and officers. They had some trucks and fuel vehicles. There weren't gas stations everywhere. They took off with great fanfare in, from Washington, D.C. in uh, 1919, and uh, it was in the summer when they left, and it took them 62 days of misery to discover that the roads that went across North America were either very poor or non-existent. And they went through burning deserts, broken bridges, stuck in gullies, torrential downpours. As someone described it as the worst road trip in America. <laughs> they averaged about six miles an hour, uh, sometimes as much as 58 miles a day, they went 3,251 miles, very tough going across Utah and Nevada. These are the days where, you know, you, they did not have the tubeless tires. You had to patch your tires, and, and they were constantly pulling each other out. And what I liked is they had uh, some guys that were scouts, not on horses, on Harleys. If you had one of those Harleys now, that would be worth a lot. They would go out ahead and explore and then come back and... Uh, now, the rest of the story, so this is the transcontinental motor convoy. The rest of the story is a lieutenant colonel who was part of that expedition. His name was Dwight Eisenhower. He then goes to Europe for World War II. 
And he sees that everybody is getting stuck in the mud in France and the little, the little trenches where the hedgerows and they couldn't move the troops and they had to keep driving these tanks through these ditches and, and it was a disaster moving the military. Finally, when they managed to get into Germany to overthrow the Nazis, they saw autobahns. You all know what an autobahn is? How many of you have driven on an autobahn? And you're, that's great, 140 miles an hour. I've got a friend that got almost 300 miles an hour on the Autobahn. And Eisenhower made a note of that. He then gets elected president. And one of the first things he does is they prepare what they call the Interstate Highway Bill. And they sign that, and let me tell you what this is. This was a bill that was to create an internet, interstate highway department, because he knew the key to our security is going to be, you got to have good roads. The roads in America, we had train tracks, but the roads were still a disaster. And um, here's what it says in the, the bill, part of what he read. On June 29, 1956, just for I was born, President Dwight Eisenhower signed the first Federal Highway Act of 1956. The bill created 41,000 miles of interstate roads, a national system, and defense highway. Do you know that's what they call it? That would, according to Eisenhower, eliminate unsafe roads, inefficient routes, traffic jams, and all the other things that got in the way of speedy, safe, transcontinental travel. At the same time, highway advocates argued in case of atomic attack, you realize this was during the Cold War, in case of atomic attack, our key cities, the roads, would quickly permit evacuation of these target areas. For all these reasons, they signed the law and they set aside $114 billion to build 41,000 miles of roads. It's now 48,000 miles of interstate. This is just the interstates because it includes Hawaii, Puerto Rico, and Alaska. And did you know in North America we have 4.4 million miles of road? One of the reasons I think the country became a great superpower is they put in the roads for transporting goods, people, and transportation exploded. Uh, roads are very important to success. They're important to survival. I don't know if any of you remember 2016. Uh, anyone ever driven in Indonesia? Jakarta or Manila? Come on. Karen and I in Kampala, Africa, took us an hour to go a mile because of the traffic. That's common in many of the cities of the world. Cairo, they're trying to rebuild the roads there now. Indonesia, 2016, 12 people died in a traffic jam that lasted three days. They didn't die because they were hit. They died because they couldn't get to the hospital. So be thankful, even though the traffic's bad here. Go to L.A. if you think it's bad here. Roads are so important. Do you know the Bible begins talking about road repair? And if you look in the Gospel of Mark, it talks about John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness. And you know what his message was? I'm actually going to read it to you from Luke. But this is Luke chapter 3, verse 3 through 6. And he, John the Baptist, went into all the region around the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins as it is written, now listen to what he quotes from the Old Testament. From the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. It's the road of the Lord. Make his path straight. Every valley will be filled and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places will be made straight and the rough ways smooth. And all flesh will see the salvation of God. The final the final goal is you want it smooth. Now I'm going to read what he's quoting from Isaiah because it's a little different when you go uh, from the Hebrew to the English. Isaiah 40, verse 3. This will not be on the screen, but it's in your Bible. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway. A highway is different from a path, isn't it? More like an interstate. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. 
Every valley will be exalted and every mountain and hill brought low. Uh, you, how many of you have driven on the interstates? I was looking at a map of the interstates. You saw one on the screen, I think, a moment ago. And I think I have been on every numbered interstate in North America, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, Alaska. I've not driven them all, but I've been on all of them at some point. And you go across country, you take 80 very far, and you're going to see they had to cut down some hills. And then there's some big valleys. They had to fill in some valleys. And what this is saying is the message that prepared for baptism is a road to our hearts. Why would John the Baptist say, we got road work, repent and be baptized? It's because the Lord wants a highway into our hearts. Cutting down the high places, some people are proud, they must be humbled. Filling up the low places, some people are so discouraged, they have no self-worth, they need to be lifted up. I remember a pastor telling me once that the work of a pastor is to comfort those who are uncomfortable and take the ones that are comfortable and make them uncomfortable. And so some of us need to be carved down, and some of us need to be filled up and to make a highway. And the last thing that happens is it's smoothed. Now, some things I preach about, and I'm, I'm just sharing what I find in the Word, some things I share with you from experience. I am a road-building pastor. I have driven a lot of bulldozers. I have worked a lot of road. I have cut a lot of road with a chainsaw, with a shovel, with a pick, with loppers. When they built this place, and I found out that because, praise the Lord, we are built on a rock, friends, if you didn't know. And I found out they were going to have to bring in not a D3 or a D4 or a D6 or a D10, but a D11. And I heard that. I said, you got to let me drive that. <laughs> that thing is a monster going down the road. And uh, finally, one of the, the project managers said, I talked to the guy, and he says, if you promise you won't kill yourself, we're going to let you... And if you go to the video when we were building this place, you'll see me up there driving the D11. Oh, that was so cool. That was on my bucket list. I am so, you could push anything with that. I mean, it would just push through rock. So I've, I've done a lot of road building. And whenever, you know, we have to maintain the road up in Covalo, our driveway's two miles long. County doesn't take care of it. We have to fix it every year. And whenever in the spring, We've got some neighbors that also do it, that uh, use the same road. In the spring, you go through it. You First, you push it with a dozer, and you, you, you fill in the places that have washed out, and you cut the places where there's landslides. So you're cutting down the high spots. You're filling in the low spots. But a bulldozer's got these big, thick tracks, and you get done, it kind of roughs it up. You know, when you're, when you're doing road building, sometimes you've got to do some destruction before you do some construction. And then when it's all done, and you got to do it right. You don't want to do it when it's hard. You want to do it when the ground's a little wet, a little soft, but not muddy. It's perfect. you got to figure out when the last rain in the spring has fallen. It's hard to do. And catch it then. Then I hook a piece of I-beam. It's a big, steel, heavy girder. They call I-beam. I've welded two loops on it. I put it on the back of my truck. And I just drive back in low gear with that thing. And it scrapes the road. It takes all those little chop, 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 chops from the bulldozer tracks, smooths them down. Any little ruts that were left, it fills them in. Any high spots, it cuts them down. It's like the inner state. It is so nice. And then it packs down. It's good all summer until winter. Hits again. How many of you have noticed new potholes after this last sto storm? A few places. We've got, we got a big one in our neighborhood. If you're not paying attention, it just showed up. You know, the, the rain gets in those potholes and it cars drive through and it keeps getting deeper and deeper. And, and uh, if you're not watching, your lower teeth become your upper teeth and you'll see what your shock absorbers look like. It's you know, praying someone will come repair the road. So when John the Baptist went to prepare the way for the Lord... He was following a practice they all understood in Bible times we're not so used to. When kings traveled, there was a crew of, of people that ran before the king, partly for security, partly to announce, get out of the way, the king is coming, partly to make sure the road was okay for his leader or chariot that was traveling. Let me give you some examples in the Bible so you know what I'm talking about. 1 Samuel 8, 11. 
And it said, this will be the behavior. Uh, Samuel is telling them, if you get a king, this is what you can expect. This will be the behavior of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for his own chariots and to be his horsemen, and some will run before his chariots. Did you catch that? They're running before the king's chariots. What are they doing? They're doing road work. They're clearing the way because the king is coming. Here's some examples of it happening. Absalom wanted to be king, and so he set things up. And it says, 2 Samuel 15, 1, After this it happened that Absalom provided himself with chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. 50. You know, uh, <laughs> I remember being in Cameroon, Africa. I understand that the, the uh, security they need for some of the African presidents is some of the most uh, serious because of frequent assassination attempts. And looking out my window... And the president was driving. I was in a hotel that was right on the main drag there in Yaoundé. And the president was driving down with his entourage. And he had like, you know, three suburban limousines. They looked typical like ours. And, and there were eight guys, four on each side of his car, running alongside on the outside of the car. And it didn't look like it was going that slow. And they are wearing suits, black suits, they got the earpieces, the sunglasses, and they were jogging alongside, and this is equatorial Africa. And I'm thinking, wow, that's commitment. So in Bible times, they'd have 50 that would run before the king and clear the road. Let me give you another one here. I think I gave you that one about Absalom. He had a younger brother that tried the same thing. 1 Kings 1.5, then Adonijah, who tried to make himself king, the son of Haggith, one of David's wives, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. And he prepared for himself chariots, chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. So you've got people that run before the king to clear the road, fix the road, make sure it's appropriate for the king to pass. They're road workers. Now, with that in mind, something happens you may have missed. How many remember when Elijah was on Mount Carmel? And um, after he prayed and the fire came down, he prayed again the rain came down, but before the rain came, he went and told King Ahab, this is what he said, 1 Kings 18.44, Elijah prayed and there was a little cloud coming out of the sky and he knew a storm was coming, he had faith, and he told King Ahab, prepare your chariot, go down before the rain stops you. Now it happened in the meantime, the sky became black with clouds and the wind and there was a heavy rain. So Ahab rode away and he went to Jezreel. That was the nearest town to Mount Carmel. And the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah and he girded up his loins and he ran ahead of Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Ahab did not have his typical road crew, his security. This is at the end of a famine. There were hardly any horses left when you read the story. Elijah humbles himself and he runs before the king. He runs before the king. Now, who came in the spirit and power of Elijah in the New Testament? We just read it. John the Baptist. So when John the Baptist is telling people to repent, he, like Elijah, is running before the king, except it's not Ahab, it's Jesus, King Jesus, to prepare the way. So I actually heard, I was in the back listening as Pastor Ross was teaching, and he talked about this very same thing. I thought, well, that's a God thing that God is going to have, you know, when Jesus came the first time, 12 apostles go preach to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. When he comes again, it's 12 times 12,000, called the 144,000. And there's not one Elijah, but there's an army of Elijahs. Not only did Elijah come in John the Baptist, but Jesus said, Elijah has come and Elijah will come, Malachi 4, before the great and terrible day of the Lord, before the second coming. He's looking for people who will go before the Lord to prepare the way of the Lord. How many of you want to be one of those that will help people uh, find the Lord? So while we're talking about road work, um, it's important to talk about an important truth in the land of Israel, dealing with the cities of refuge. Numbers 35, verse 13. And the cities which you give shall have six cities of refuge. 
You'll appoint three on this side of the Jordan, and three you shall appoint in the land of Canaan, which will be cities of refuge. These six cities shall be for refuge for the children of Israel, for the stranger, not just for the people of Israel, but for the stranger and for the guest among them, that anyone who kills a person accidentally might flee there. I don't know if you ever played hide-and-seek and you were safe if you can get to home base. Kind of like baseball. You got to get home. Well, if you were in trouble, you had to get to the city of refuge. Joshua 20. Now, by the way, it's also mentioned in Deuteronomy chapter 4. Joshua 20, verse 1. The Lord also spoke to Joshua, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, Appoint for yourselves cities of refuge, of which I spoke to you through Moses, that the slayer who kills a person accidentally or unintentionally may flee there and there will be refuge from the avenger of blood. So, Moses actually gives an example in the Bible. Uh, two guys are out in the woods and they're chopping wood. It happens all the time. They actually had axe heads. You remember an axe head flew off the handle in the story of Elisha. And if you don't keep your axe head firmly secured, the way to do that is you drive in a peg and you soak it in water. And... But in the summer, if your axe has been out, it gets loose and you go to swing your axe and you go back and it flies off the handle, bonks your neighbor in the head, and he dies. Well, there's no one to witness it. For all they know, you is premeditated murder and you're an axe murderer. And the family finds that he's been killed and they were sort of the, the, they were the investigators and they, they would come and execute you. The oldest brother usually took it upon himself or you're out... You know, you guys are working on a house together, you and your buddies, and you're stacking stones, and you're way up on the wall, and you call down to your friend, you're having a good time, your buddies, and you call down, you say, you know, can you send up some more mortar, and you turn around, and you bump a brick up on the wall, and it falls off the wall, and it hits him in the head, and kills him. Now, you know what that means. Don't work with that guy anymore, he's unlucky, because... <laughs> He's already hit you with an axe and he's dropped a brick on your head. <laughs> that means now that the family hears a ruckus. They come around the other side of the house. They see this person's dead on the ground, bleeding. You've been trying to give CPR, but they think you're strangling them. They don't know what's going on. And you go, no, no. And they get angry and you think, uh-oh, city of refuge. You need to not go back to the house to get your garment. Don't go to the ATM to take money out because as soon as they see that, they're going to tell the older brother and he's going to get all the younger brothers and families and they're going to come and they've got a right to kill you. He's called the avenger of blood because you have shed innocent blood. Now, thank God, uh, the law of Moses made a provision that if it was what they call manslaughter or unintentional bloodshed, there was a provision that you, you're... You didn't mean it. It might have been negligent, but that's not cause for execution. It's like, you know, sometimes people look the wrong way and they hit somebody on a bicycle and the judge is usually not going to give them the death sentence for that. It might be negligence, but it's not a deliberate manslaughter. So Moses arranged that there were six cities under God's direction, three on one side of the Jordan, three on the other, that they could flee from the avenger of blood. And it tells us what the names were. By the way, these were all Levitical cities. Now, the Levites were spread all through the land of Israel. They had 48 cities, the Levites. All of the cities of refuge were cities where there were a lot of Levites. They're the ones who make atonement. They preach. They teach the word. And you've got Bezer, Ramoth and Gilead, and Golan. And that would be on the east side. And then you've got Kadesh, in Galilee, Shechem, and Kirjath Arba, which is also Hebron. They're one and the same. Later, we believe Jerusalem was also added and considered a city of refuge, and it would have been the fourth city of refuge. Because, and let me give you some examples for that. Uh, 1 Kings 2, verse 36. Then the king, Solomon, he sent and called for Shimei. Shimei was a Benjamite who had cursed David when he was running from Absalom. Solomon called for Shemiah and he said, Build your house in Jerusalem. Dwell there. Do not go out from there anywhere, for it will be. Now, the king had a right to kill him for treason. But um, he said, I'm going to give you a chance. If you stay in the city, 
you'll live. It'll be on the day that you go out and you cross the brook, brook Kidron. Know for certain you will surely die. Your blood will be on your own head. And Solomon was pretty wise. He knew he couldn't control himself. And when Shimei's slaves ran away, he went running after them and he left and went down to Gath. Solomon, he's wisest king. He's going to find out. He found out. He left the city of refuge and he died. Then you get some uh, other examples of how people would flee. And this again is in, in um, Jerusalem. Look in 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 50. After David died, I told you Adonijah, Solomon's brother, tried to make himself king, even though David said Solomon was supposed to be king. Well, his coup backfired, and now he thought, oh, Solomon's going to kill me. So what does he do? 1 Kings 1, verse 50. Now Adonijah was afraid of Solomon, and he arose, and he went, and he took hold of the horns of the altar. He fled into Jerusalem. He went into the temple. He went there into the courtyard where the priests go, and he got a hold of the horns of the altar. And it was told Solomon, saying, Indeed, Adonijah is afraid of King Solomon, for look, he's taken hold of the horns of the altar. Why did he do that? Because they all understood it was home base. He was safe. If you stay there. Did you know that in early America, we didn't have sanctuary cities, but churches were sanctuaries. I think it's still on the books in many states that if a person could get into a church, they were protected, not from everything, but from being deported, for example. So he goes and he takes hold of the horns of the altar. And, and Ben and I said, come forth. He said, I'm not letting go of the horns until I get word I'm forgiven. Solomon said, if you prove yourself an honest man, you'll live. Well, he did let him live for a while, but then he tried another um, treacherous thing. He tried to overthrow Solomon by marrying one of David's former wives, Abishag, and Solomon said, I know what you're up to, and he had him executed. Another example, 1 Kings 2.28 so Joab fled to the tabernacle of the Lord and took hold of the horns of the altar. Again, you've got them fleeing to the tabernacle. Now, the tabernacle, the temple's not built yet. Tabernacle's still in the, a curtain. It's outside Jerusalem. But they got a hold of the horns of the altar. And he takes hold. And this is a little different situation. Adonijah was safe as long as he was holding on to the horns of the altar. But not Joab. Joab was a good general. He was David's general for 40 years. But Joab was a man of war. He killed two men in cold blood because Abner, who was the general for King Saul, Abner killed Joab's brother Asahel in a battle. And you can read about it. It's an interesting story. Asahel is chasing Abner. Abner says, stop chasing me. They're having this conversation. And he wouldn't stop. He said, Stop chasing me. Look, if you're trying to get some armor from one of the soldiers you killed, he said, take one of the guys on my right and left, but don't keep chasing me. I don't know if he was in a chariot or what was going on. The Bible says Asahel was as fast as a gazelle. That's what it says. And Abner's telling him, he says, if I kill you, how can I look your brother Joab in the eye? Joab was the older brother. He wouldn't listen. Abner took the back end of his spear and hit Asahel in the chest and killed him. Long time after this, Joab would not forget. And even after David has made peace and the war is over, Joab calls Abner over and says, yeah, let's talk, pulls out a sword and kills him right there in cold blood. He does that twice. And so um, when he goes and he takes hold of the horns of the altar, Benaniah, the, he's the uh, general for Solomon, he says, what do I do? Solomon says, the word of the Lord says he should die. He doesn't get, if he's guilty of murder, the home base doesn't work. If someone committed premeditated murder and they fled to a city of refuge, when they did the investigation, if they found out it was premeditated, they sent him out to the avenger of blood. So you can't think you continue in known willing sin and you're just going to be forgiven. By the way, Look in Exodus 21, verse 14. But if a man acts with premeditation against his neighbor to kill him by treachery, you shall take him from my altar that he may die. If he, take him from my altar. He might be clinging to the horns of the altar, but if he's committed premeditated murder, 
It's not a license for sin. There is mercy with God. There is a, an altar. And if we're clinging to the altar for mercy, God is merciful to us. By the way, with this in mind, what do you think Paul is talking about in Hebrews 6? That by two immutable things in which it's impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope that is set before us. Here Paul is drawing on somebody who flees to the tabernacle and gets a hold of the horns of the altar and is asking for mercy. Except we're going into the, not just the outside courtyard, we're going into the mercy seat where Christ has entered before into the presence of God. And we're not pleading the blood of goats, we're pleading the blood of Jesus. So we find refuge. In the analogies that you have here in the Bible, so, wait, wait, let me, what shall I say now? The, let me tell you a little bit more about the cities of refuge. So, because a person might need to flee on one of these roads for their life, you've heard about running for your life? Uh, they had to keep the roads clear. Um, every spring, the Levites would go out, they'd inspect the roads, they'd make sure that they were passable and that they were clear. Um, they were guarded. They were protected. In fact, I think I've got a quote here from Josephus who describes with some detail the, um, the roads and what was going on there. Yeah. In Antiquities, Volume 8, 7, it's, look it up. Solomon had caused the principal roads to be paved with black stone. Back in Solomon's day, it's a silver was like stones. So they used this basalt to pave the roads. Toll was apparently levied in the time of Ezra, but the clergy were exempt from this as all from all taxation. The roads to the cities for refuge required to be always kept in good order. According to the Talmud, they were 48 feet wide. Now, for an ancient road, that's like wider than the Roman roads. They were 48 feet wide and provided with bridges with signposts uh, where the roads diverge. Roads were annually repaired in the spring, preparatory for going up to the great feasts. To prevent the possibility of danger, no subterranean structure, you couldn't have anything going under the road. However protected, even if you had a culvert, was allowed under a public road. Overhanging branches had to be cut down so that a man on a camel could pass. So not only did they keep it smooth, they had to keep it high, they got rid of all the obstructions. Uh, and this is from the book Patriarchs and Prophets, 516. The cities of refuge were so distributed as to be within a half day's journey of every part of the land. That's a half day's journey on foot. The roads leading to them were always to be kept in good repair. All along the way, signposts were there to be erected bearing the words refuge. Now, while I'm reading this, what do these roads represent? Well, it's talking about showing the way of salvation making it clear to people, helping them know which way to go. And, you know, you and I, they see the road in our lives by our example. Refuge in plain, bold characters on the signs of the fleeing one might not be delayed for even a moment. He's got the posse chasing after him. Any person, Hebrew, stranger, or sojourner, might avail himself of this provision but while the guiltless were not to be rashly slain, neither were the guilty to escape punishment. The case of the fugitive was to be fairly tried at the proper authorities, and only when found innocent of intentional murder was he to be protected in the city of refuge. And they would give him a place to stay and some work to do so he could be fed. Uh, the guilty were given up to the avenger, and uh, those who were entitled protection could receive it only on condition of remaining within the appointed refuge. Should one wander away from beyond the prescribed limits and be found by the avenger of blood, his life would pay the penalty of his disregard for the Lord's provision. At the death of the high priest, however, all who had sought shelter in the cities of refuge were at liberty to return to their possession. Isn't that interesting? So, I want you to notice some things about the cities. The cities were to be announced they were to be available, and they were to be accessible to all. 
The cities were to be prominent. They were to build them up on a hill. As a matter of fact, some of the cities like Ramoth and Gilead, it means heights. Jesus said, Matthew 5, 14, You are the light of the world, a city that is set where? On a hill. Cannot be said. The cities of refuge were not down on a valley. You know why they were up on a hill? Because sometimes, all right, you've had, there's been an accidental death. The family is gathered together, the posse. They're coming after you. You want to live until you can be tried and shown. I had no animosity. It was an accident. And you're taken off towards the city of refuge. And you're, you're running. And you stop and you rest. You turn around. You see the cloud of death. The posse is coming. They're coming after you. The avenger of blood. Is there an avenger of blood coming after us? Are we all guilty of sin? Penalty for sin is death. But we've got someone who's going to take our place. So we're heading for the city of refuge. Christ is the city of refuge. There were people, guards on the wall, the cities were up on a hill, they would say, looks like we've got someone coming. Open the gates. They would open the gates and let you in, and they close the gates to hold the posse out and say, they are within the city of refuge. The priests would protect them until they could be fairly tried. So they were up on a hill. They were prominent. They were prepared. Not only did they have housing in the city, where if there was a refuge, they had a place for the refuge to go. Um, but they made sure that the roads were not clogged, the gates were not closed, bridges were kept open, and they were protected. Now, in Bible times, they did not have a separate police force and a separate military. The military, in times of peace, they'd have garrisons at the city. They were the police. They would enforce the laws of the land, the laws of the king. So these cities were protected. They were for convocation, mobilization, and proclamation. All right, what do I mean by that? Well, these are the same roads that were used for the feasts. You just heard me read that. And three times a year, you can read it here in Exodus 23, 14, several places. It says that three times you will keep a feast to me in a year. And it was during these great convocations of roads. That's why they're 48 feet wide. There were great parades of believers that would come. So they needed to be kept open. They were kept open for mobilization. You notice when uh, Eisenhower had the Interstate Act, part of it was for the defense. So they could move the troops on something, you know, if the only thing an army has for moving their troops is a train, you blow up one train track, it stops. Uh, we learned that when we first were settling the West, the Indians realized that all they had to do was take out one rail, and that train went off the track, and they stopped everything. So it was for mobilizing the armies, and it was also for these, the proclamation. That, to me, is, I think, the most important part. Who used these roads? What was the work of the Levites? They went through the land of Israel. They were the preachers. They were the teachers. They were also the doctors. The Levites were the ones who would inspect for various illness, and they'd prescribe different cures. So the Levites were... Um, you know, in early America, they had a word called the parson. The parson. It's a derivative of the word the person. That was often a pastor in the community that was something like the magistrate. He was the sheriff. He was the doctor. Uh, he would officiate at weddings. He would officiate at funerals. They called him the parson. And uh, had a little bit of everything. So these roads were used for proclamation. That makes sense when you read Isaiah 52, verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. So these roads were also kept open for the spread of the gospel. You and I need to keep the roads open. You know, I'm reading a, a great book Pastor Ross recommended to me about the first exploration of the Amazon. And I was in the process reading about the Inca Indians and how Francisco Pizarro basically overthrew uh, the Inca Empire. And Athalupa, the king, you know, Pizarro wanted gold. And he said, well, my kingdom's 2,000 miles. And he said, I can have runners run the whole road system. The Incas had 25,000 miles of roads that had been built primarily for communication of the king. And many of them are still in existence today because they were made of stone. Now, the Roman roads 
Uh, they were quite something, but I think that the Incas had more roads. And some of the stones that they moved were incredible. They would have 25 runners could cover 150 miles in one day. That's on foot. They would, like Pony Express, they'd go on these relays, just full out like marathon runners running. They had rest houses where another runner would pick it up. They'd take the king's message. There was an urgency. The king could get the message all throughout his empire in no time at all because of the roads. You need good roads to get the message out. And you and I are to be proclaiming the message and we're to be maintaining the roads. Amen? You've read in Habakkuk 2, verse 2, Then the Lord answered me, saying, Write the vision and make it plain on tables that he may run who reads it. We're supposed to make it possible for people to run with this message, going everywhere. Now, while we're talking about doing road repair and making it possible to... Uh, get the message out, and preparing the way for the king. Our king is coming. Amen? Amen? And we, like modern Elijahs and John the Baptist, are to be telling people to turn from their sin. There is mercy with God, and the king is coming, and get them ready. But it's hard for us to talk to everybody about clearing the road if we've got obstacles in our own road. Is the highway to your heart clear? Or do you have something that's blocking the way? Little story. So, we've had the place up in the hills over 40 years now and maintain our own road. When I first put in the road that came from the county road, several of our friends here have been there, you know what I mean? From the county road to our house, like I said, it's two miles long. And... Uh, How many of you see my country living video I did? Oh, you get to stay members. The rest of you are excommunicated. It's on YouTube. It's free. Anyway, so um, when I first put it in, I just wanted to get it open wide enough to get through. And I fixed it up every year. But there was this one stump. There had been a forest fire 100 years ago. There was this big black stump that was in the middle of the road, or almost in the middle of the road, that you'd come around this turn going downhill, and if you weren't careful, if the road was wet or if there was ice or snow on the road, you could slide into that thing. And, and every time going in and going out, I always had to slow down when I came to this stump that was invading the road. I kept hoping it would rot, but you know, when a stump has been burnt, they don't rot. And this was huge. It was from what you'd call virgin timber. And every time I drove by that thing, I said, One of these days, I'm, if I have to get my chainsaw out, I will get out and I'll just cut it up into little pieces and I can get rid of it one piece at a time. You can do that. But every time I saw it, I'm halfway somewhere. I'm in a hurry. I'm gone. I want to get home. I want to get out. And I just, I never did get to it. This went on for years. Every time I look at that thing, I curse it, shake my fist, say, one of these days. I nearly slide into it, coming around the corner too fast, going back and forth, taking the kids to the school bus. And, and one day I told Karen, we got a bulldozer. I bought a used bulldozer. I told Karen, I said, I'm going to go clear the road for the spring. And I said, you can come check on me if I don't come back. <laughs> and so I, it should, you know, just take you an hour. You just drop the blade and you kind of walk the road. And I'm, I'm walking the road. I'm going up the road. And I come to the part of the road where that stump is. And I sat there on top of the dozer. It's just idling. And I'm looking at it. And it's way too big to push over, but I thought, I'll try. And so I nudged the dozer up to it, and I go, mmm, and I push it. It doesn't budge. I just made a little cut in the wood with the blade. I thought, well, maybe I'll take a run at it. So I revved the engine. I ran at it. Of course, running with a bulldozer is five miles an hour. So you go, boom. It didn't go anywhere. But I thought I detected just a little bit of movement. And I thought, well, I'll come uphill. I'll push downhill. That's always better. I got up, came uphill, tried to push it downhill. And my track starts spinning. It's not going anywhere. And I thought, well, you know, maybe if I cut a little bit into the ground, because I thought I saw the ground around the stump move a little bit. That means it, it's, it's possible. And so I took the blade, and I, I tried to cut around the base of it and cut some roots and pushed at it. Cut some more roots, pushed at it. And I thought, well, this is getting to be a bigger job. And I realized I'm making a little bit of a mess here. You know, you can't do anything with a bulldozer neatly. 
And I, I kept digging at it. I thought, well, I'm either going to fill it back in and go away or I'm going to do it. And I said, you know, it's now or never. And I said, one of us is going to lose today. <laughs> it's the stump or me. <laughs> and I just started digging and digging and digging. And the roots kept going, and I was bumping it. But it was getting, it was moving a little bit. I'd ram it, and it'd move, and I'd go, boom, you know, and hit it with a bulldozer. And I actually put it in high gear and hit it again and just about dislocated my neck. And I'm digging down. And finally, it got where there is a crater around this thing because I'm trying to cut the roots. And I didn't realize the, the ball of this thing, of the root, was enormous. And it's all wrapped, the roots were all wrapped around rocks and dirt. There was like concrete. It's like I'm trying to push this great big concrete pier out of the ground. And then I hear a motor, and Karen comes up the road. <laughs> and she looks, and she sees, I've just dug up the whole road. There's no way you can get by. <laughs> There's a big crater in the road. And, but I said, I'm not giving up. And so she watched the, the final episode. And... Um, I kept digging, and I'm actually the dozer. I got such a big hole going on, the dozer's half buried. You can't, it's half disappeared in the hole that I've dug, trying to get under this thing. And after a while, I kept going and pushing and cutting roots one at a time, and I pushed a little more, and I was hearing things pop and snap. I'm going, yes, yes, yes. And I finally got it with this great big lumbering move. It rolled off the edge of the road, and it's very steep there, which is why that was always so dangerous. And it began to keep rolling down the hill. And I yelled down, watch out, Bambi and Thumper, it's coming. <laughs> no, I didn't do that. Anyway, and it, it went down the hill, and I had this big hole in the ground. Well, that's not so much work. I had dirt everywhere. I, I filled it in, smoothed it over. It was a little dip for a few years, but I filled it in over a couple of years. Every time I drive by there now, it feels so good. <laughs> the stump is gone. So do you have any stumps in your life? You've been driving around them? Did you just get used to it? It's there mocking you? You talk about being a Christian, but you know there's something that it's got to go. It's obstructing the road. It's obstructing the way of the king in your life. And he's given you the means to dig it up. God's got a big bulldozer. Power of his spirit I thought it was interesting that um, when were you able to go free from the city of refuge? When the high priest died. That's very interesting. Why then? Well, the Jews in the Talmud, they had a couple of theories. They said, for one thing, because the death of the high priest was seen as atonement. His life was seen as atonement. And um, when he died... It was a time of forgiveness. The other thing is, is the rabbis say, when the high priest died, it was considered a national calamity. You know, think like when JFK was assassinated and something like that the whole nation is sort of in mourning or the challenger explodes or 9-11. And as the whole nation was in mourning, he said people gave up their vengeance and aggression in times like that. They humbled themselves. Who is our high priest? Jesus, it's the death of the high priest that makes it possible for us to go home. Now, I want to conclude by telling you what does the name of the cities of refuge mean? Those names are not random. Let me tell you again, it's Kadesh, Shechem, Hebron, Bezer, Ramoth, Golan, Jerusalem. Kadesh means righteousness. The Bible says, the Lord is our righteousness, Jeremiah 33, 16. Shechem means shoulder. Isaiah 9, 6 says the government will be on his shoulders. Hebron means fellowship. 1 Corinthians 9 talks about in the fellowship of his son Jesus. Bezer means fortress. Psalm 91, 2, he is my refuge and my fortress. Amen? Ramoth means heights. These cities were high. Jesus causes us to ride upon the high places of the earth, Isaiah 58. Golan means joy. The, Lord, uh, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Amen? 
Nehemiah 8.10. And Jerusalem, you all know. What does it mean? City of peace. Shalom means peace. Jeru city. Jeru shalom, city of peace. These cities of refuge were all talking about Christ. They were all types of Christ because Jesus is our city. Jesus told the apostles, he says, I'm going. He says, you know the way. Thomas says, we don't know where you're going. We don't know the way. And what did Jesus say? I am the way. I am the road. I am the way, the truth, and the life. You know, I like that verse there in Proverbs 18. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. Friends, we're all guilty of sin. There is an avenger of blood that's on our tails, and he is not going to give up. And our only safety, it's like the angel said to Lot, flee. I can't do anything until you flee. And Lot, do you know, Lot didn't go to the hills first. He went to a city of refuge called Zoar. And he says, I can't do anything until you get there. God told me, let him get to the city of refuge. You and I need to flee from the wrath to come. Jesus is our city, amen? amen. To save us from judgment. And once we find that safety, then you and I need to be road workers, amen? amen. We need to clear the path, cut down the high spots, fill in the low spots, straighten out the crooked ways. You got anything crooked need straightening? And make a smooth path for the Savior to our hearts and for others to Jesus. Is that your desire? <laughs>